Hi, I'm Mark from the Microtasker Project. Today I'd like to introduce the NXP IMX RT family, which is now being supported by the Microtasker Project. Now, I've been working about seven months intensively on this project, and I'll just show you a few pieces of hardware which I've been using. Here we have the baby of the family, it's the IMX RT1010. Processor starts at about $1 if you buy them in fairly good quantities, runs at 500 megahertz. Here we have a bigger board from the NXP um, EVK line with the 1064 on it, dual USB, uh, dual um, Ethernet, although we've only got one Ethernet connection on the actual board. I uh, can drive an LCD, 600 megahertz, a load of features. This is another board from uh, Embedded Artists, which has a an OEM module and also a display. Here's one of the OEM modules. They have uh, one with the IMX RT1052 on and one with the IMX RT1064. And this is a Teensy 4.0 board with the IMX RT1064 on. I've been messing around with it a bit, that's why it's got um, an SD card hanging on it. So, what are these IMX RT parts? Well, they're what they're calling crossover parts. They're sort of bridging between the embedded world and the application world. So embedded world, deep embedded controls, uh, fast communication, application, you know, going towards embedded Linux PCs. And what makes these parts very interesting are price, performance, features. So let's take a look at what you actually get for your money. So let's take a look at the general range of offerings. We're not going to look at every single part, but we're going to start off with the base one. This is the IMX RT1011. You can get this thing for about $1 in quantity. For that, you're going to get a 500 MHz Cortex M7 processor with quite an array of peripherals. I've just highlighted a few. You're going to get 128 kilobytes of on-chip RAM. Now that can run up to 500 megahertz. You're going to get one high-speed on-the-go um, USB interface. You're going to get four UARTs, two I2C interfaces, a couple of SPI interfaces, and so on. Moving up to the 1015. You're going to get a few more peripherals, and both of these parts, by the way, also have single precision floating point units. If you go up to the 1021, you're going to be looking at paying about $2.3, and for that, you're going to get twice the memory, you're going to get a couple of CAN interfaces, you're going to get Ethernet on top of it, and 8 UARTs. Jumping up to the 1052, here you're going to get 600 megahertz of uh, speed, 512 kilobytes of on-chip RAM. You're going to get an external memory interface and also an LCD controller. On top of that, two high-speed USB on-the-go interfaces, two SD card interfaces, an Ethernet, if you can afford $3.5, we're looking at a 1062 with one megabyte of on-chip RAM and two Ethernet controllers. The top of the range of the, um, the available chips at the moment without DSP, we're looking at a 1064. That's a bit more expensive, mainly because of the fact that it has onboard flash. However, don't get too excited about this flash because it is SPI flash and all of these chips essentially need SPI flash to work. Rather than being on chip, the other ones will have it off chip. Although in this introductory video we're only going to sort of scratch the surface, there is something very fundamental which needs to be understood before we go any further. That is, 
we have a Cortex M7 processor with a boot ROM. Now that means that it can boot up using this fixed boot ROM. The boot ROM gives the user the possibility to load program via UART or high speed USB. Users program will tend to be stored in external SPI NOR flash with options to also store it on SD cards or on parallel uh, bus connected memory. However, not all of the parts allow this. And also for deeply embedded applications where we're not talking about megabytes of program, then this is the one which we're going to uh, concentrate on. It's also the common denominator across all of these chips. So once our external memory has been loaded with an application, what will happen is then that the bootloader, which is the internal boot ROM, will allow this to operate. Now a very interesting part of these chips is that they have something called a flex SPI bus. Now that supports single wire connections, four wire connections, quad flash, or up to eight wire connections, for example, hyper flash. And the processor itself can access this as if it was memory mapped internally. That means that when this when program is to run from this um, memory area here there'll be a burst read from it and then the processor will be able to access it in a local buffer in addition cache operation also means that external accesses are not required all the time all of the chips also support an encrypted form of operation that means that the code is encrypted in the external flash but it will do on-the-fly decryption so that the processor can still operate at full speed. Internal memory is called Flex RAM. Flex RAM divides the internal RAM banks up between tightly coupled data flash, which has zero weight state operation for data storage, um, to tightly coupled instruction ROM, which has also zero weight state full speed operation for instruction accesses, and general purpose RAM. Now, the areas or the banks of the memory which are assigned to general purpose RAM uh, cannot be accessed at full speed. They work at up to one quarter of the speed, but they do benefit from caching. So what we've learned already from these chips is they're very quick they're pretty cheap, but they do need an external flash, unless you take a 1064 part which has the external flash internal. So now we can finalize the general microtasker concept of the use of the IMXRT in deeply embedded systems. This is our minimum configuration, the IMXRT with an external SPI NOR flash. We program our program into this NOR flash via the high-speed USB interface thanks to the boot ROM's capability. We do not need to use JTAG unless we're doing debug operations. We don't use OCR RAM because there's no real advantage if we are working with this two-chip solution. We copy our program when it starts up into ITC. That gives us full speed instruction operation, for example, 500 or 600 megahertz, depending on the chip, zero weight state. And we put our variables, heap and stack into the DTC. Here's an example. Assuming we're using the IMX RT1020 family, which has 256 kilobytes of RAM. And assuming we have a program size of our application of 136 kilobytes. Now, that is quite a big microtasker program. This will allow you to do um, USB classes, TCP IP, file systems on SD cards, etc. What we do is we configure the ITC so that this code will fit. That gives us 160 kilobytes due to the fact that the banks in the flash RAM are 32 kilobytes each. We have to round up slightly. That gives us a remainder of 96 kilobytes for our variables, heap and stack. We've disabled the OCR function because we don't believe that, that is 
um, usable or has any real advantages in normal operations. We take a pretty small SPI flash. I mean, we're talking about 50% or less for one of these nowadays. And we divide this up into the utilization of our program space, let's say 256, adequate for this chip parameter system of 64 kilobytes and that gives us also 704 kilobytes of file system space. So what I've shown you is the basic microtasker concept using these IMXRT devices. We run code in the um, instruction uh, memory so that we get full instruction speed. That means 500, 600 megahertz if you want, zero white state operation. We also put our data into the tightly coupled data memory, which means that that's also running with zero white states to give you the maximum performance. There are also some other advantages of this. We don't have the slow accesses due to the um, SPI bus. That means we don't let code normally run from the chip itself. Uh, the chip then, the SPI flash chip, when it's not being accessed for file system um, storage or whatever, it can switch itself into its low power um, standby, which means that you've got lower um, uh, current consumption as well. Um, and also another point in embedded systems is that because we don't have this external access taking place during the general operation, uh, which could be up to 133 uh, megabit per second on these lines. We also get less radiation, so we get optimum operation speed. Uh, we get um, lowest power consumption because the, um, the SPI flash is not needed most of the time. And also we get lowest EMC radiation. Many thanks for watching this introductory video. I will be back with more videos going deeply into the technical details of these devices and also how to optimally use them using the Microtasker project.